Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Adventure Learning is a hybrid online education approach where students from around the world are brought together to discuss real-world issues in a collaborative learning environment. Adventure Learning is not simply a video or a blog. At the heart of the adventure are collaboration and interaction opportunities centered around a research curriculum based on the region where the adventure takes place. Go North is a free adventure learning program developed at the University of Minnesota. It is the world's first circumpolar education program. Go North provides a free 400 plus page natural and social science curriculum for K-12 classrooms. In 2006, Team Go North traveled to the Alaskan Arctic where they focused on the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and the people who live in that region. They gave students numerous perspectives on the issue of oil exploration as they traveled through the native communities. In 2007, Team Go North went to Chukotka, Russia, on the far eastern coast of Asia. The team traveled up the coast through Provodinia and Labyrinthia, where they experienced the traditional ways from seal hunting to upa fishing. The team also focused on mineral exploration and what the region and its people provide to the world. In 2008, Team Go North traveled to Arctic Norway, Sweden, and Finland, which is known as Fennoscandia. There they met the Sami people who live in the region called Sapmi. The team traveled throughout these countries providing students with first-hand experience about deforestation, how it's changed the lives of the people there and its impact on this region. On their expedition, the team sets out to answer five questions with each year's curriculum. What is the Arctic and what makes it unique? Who are the Arctic people, their traditions and their knowledge? How do we affect the Arctic, and how does the Arctic ecosystem affect life on Earth? What part can we take in protecting the environment and the life of traditional people? Will a commitment to sustainability make a difference in our lives? Adventure learning is, of course, adventure-based. For Team Go North, this involves an authentic narrative, a story that unfolds as the team travels through various regions. What that means for students is that there is always something to look forward to. Students eagerly await what the next weekly update will contain. This makes the student a part of the team. They become part of the story that is unfolding. The learning activities all tie into the module they are in, so they reinforce the learning. Bringing all these students together from around the world presents spectacular collaboration opportunities. Go North provides collaboration zones where students are posting their own media, such as video, audio, and pictures. Go North also has online expert chats. Experts answer questions from students around the world, allowing them to truly participate in the adventure learning experience. The adventure learning program is internet driven, so it gives all teachers and students easy access to all parts of the adventure. To tie the adventure to the classroom even further, Team Go North includes a different teacher explorer on each expedition. Mick Hamilton was the first teacher explorer to join the team. Arctic stuff and, and Arctic exploration is something that's, that's held my, my dreams since the, the mid-80s, since I was in high school. I've always kind of seen that out there. I never really thought I'd, I'd be doing it, but um, it, just, it was a great honor to, to be the, the first teacher explorer to go on a longer expedition to get flown in. and. Uh, that was the beginning of the, the great adventure, as I told Aaron when I got out of the cab. I said, this is, this is going to be a great adventure, and, and he was happy to hear that because... In 2007, Jeff Sipper joined the team to travel across Arctic Russia. The Chukchi natives, the adults and kids, very warm, open, friendly, um, very generous. Um, like the fact that we were traveling by dog sled, uh, willing to talk to us right away. Uh, we camped right outside town for a day. Um, 
And then we were on for a day that we couldn't possibly imagine the following day. Uh, and we headed out into the open tundra and we went to a Uranga. And so probably for me, the Uranga visit was tops. Um, I couldn't believe I'm sitting in this Uranga with reindeer hide and took a look at their way of life. Uh, they let us go into their sleeping quarters draped by reindeer hide and lit by seal oil lamps. Um, totally awesome to me. The Uranga is uh, basically a, a giant tent made out of reindeer hide. That was an amazing thing and they were in the process of creating a, a second Uranga when we were there. Their sleeping quarters was surrounded by reindeer, reindeer hide. Um, all in, so they slept in there. It was really quite warm. It was in the middle of the Uranga. The Uranga was huge. I don't know how to give you dimensions as far as size, but they cooked in there, ate in there, lived in there, you name it, got out of the elements in there, um, but yet it could be portable if they needed to move it. Looking out in the open country, we could see the reindeer herd far off in the distance, thinking that that's where we would see them from. And no, we got into a Jeep and we went out to the herd. And we got within 200 yards and we noticed a stray calf. And so everybody was trying to herd the calf back to the main herd, but it didn't work out. It just kept going the other way. We got about what, 200 yards of them and took a bunch of pictures and they were calving at the time and we're just totally amazed with that. Thinking that the day was done, we headed back to town. Uh, I should mention that our tour guide the whole time was the mayor. And so he said, I want you to go out and see a greenhouse. And of course, there's another revelation for me. I'm going like, wow, a greenhouse in the Arctic? I, I, this doesn't make sense. I'm the last thing I'd be thinking of. So we head into the back country, about 45 minutes from town. And sure enough, here's a long greenhouse. And they're already growing things inside of it. Um, hot compared to where you know the outdoor temperatures that we were in that was amazing it was a celebration of us being there I've always liked to watch different cultural dances and try to figure out the stories behind them and that was that was what I really wanted to, to find out it was really, it, to see a small community like that come together and just kind of forget about everything and just, it, from little kids, I mean, really little kids, all the way up to the elders, they're all dancing and, and telling their stories together. It was really, really neat to see. The other thing that we got to do when we were in Lorena is to have and attend a dance festival, a traditional dance. Um, and we got to witness something called throat singing. Um, never will forget it. It was amazing. Uh, and again, we got some native food like uh, muktuk. Um, how to describe muktuk? Muktuk is whale. I like fish. Very, very strong fish tasting. Um, didn't eat much. It was for me. It was like ta you know eating a, a maximum fishy rubber band. But again, something you acquire a taste for. Certainly, I wasn't there yet. Um, and so we got to eat with them in the community center as well. And so the welcoming of us by the Chukchi natives in Marina was heartwarming. We also put on a presentation for their students. Um, and every time that we put on a presentation, then we would invite them down in the evening if they wanted to come down and be with the dogs, because we would feed about five o'clock in the evening and then the students could come down and intermingle with the dogs and us. And, it was kind of um, heartwarming, um, and then all the kids that came down would sign the sleds every time too, so we had all kinds of signatures along the sleds. We leave Lorena and we head out into the open country again, pretty much traveling next to the Bering Sea, and that day I think we covered 23 miles, and it was quite warm actually. There's been so many things each day that are different and unique, and sometimes it's just almost overwhelming. 
um, from the cultural activities that we've had a chance to take in to the great people that we've met to the awesome scenery to sleeping out on the Bering Sea last night when it was dead quiet and calm. Um, just everything is completely different and, and unique. While the adventure is the center of an adventure learning project, it is important to understand the research that goes into making a highly usable experience for teachers. Here, Professor Aaron Deering talks to his class about delivering a highly usable adventure learning experience. That's actually a good one. It's a very good one. So, what we're saying is that when we design learning environments or to create experiences, we want them to have these educational, social, and technological affordances. Meaning that when you go into the experience, it makes sense and it feels good. But you've all been to a, a website or a, what I would call a learning environment and it just pulls you in. And the way that you navigate within it just feels right. So we have affordance are those artifacts of an environment that determine if and how the environment can be used by an observer. It's pretty, uh, pretty generic, but let's take a look at this. So the quality and effectiveness of collaborative distance education is contingent upon the design of and the student's engagement in the learning environment. And I think you're going to see that the design is going to reflect the engagement. Very seldom are you going to have engagement without the, the good design. Kirscher suggests that the use of appropriately designed and implemented educational, social, and technological affordance is a foundation for stimulating, engaging, and maintaining collaboration amongst learners. And thus, we know from how people learn that collaboration is the best way to get students that um, engage and get them to learn. What was interesting about this is that when we looked at what Kirshner was writing and what everyone was talking about, they said, okay, this is what we need to have. We need to have these affordances. But no one could give an example of it. Like, there, there, were, there were no papers that were written about what the affordances are, make, making it real world, right? And that's what's wrong with a lot of academia is that they can't take this theory and put it into action. So we thought about adventure learning. And we thought about go north. We thought about what we're doing. And we said, well, we're going to write a paper where we address all these affordances. Um, it was a lot of fun. So what we said here is that adventure learning makes use of anchor-based collaborative and situated pedagogies, educational, between students, teachers, and experts, and adventures. Social, using the internet as a means for efficient and useful collaboration, technological. What I said with the curriculum, and you saw this before, but we start off with an alert. And that is, we tell them what it is that they need to solve within this module. I call them situated movies, but you'll see that every single module has a situated movie that says, students, this is breaking news. We need your help to solve this. So they've actually been warned to think twice about breastfeeding their babies. But as one Inuit hunter, Loco to Coral Harbor, put it, I've never we, we scaffold it with different levels of activities. We ha have the teacher support in the back. and students and teachers can go in there and become part of it without hopefully um, a huge learning curve. Adventure Base, again what we talked about, it's a narrative, it is a story that's unfolding, and it's a hook. And this is a problem with many online learning environments is that there's, or many online courses, that there's nothing that brings the learner in. Then the sync learning opportunities. So you have a Google Earth activity, you have a collaboration zone, you have the moderated chats, you have the brain pot movies. We deliver this in a way that you have them all working together. You have the ability to go to the trail report, see, that, see the adventure, experience the adventure. Within the trail report, everything is linked to another um, feature of the learning environment, so everything works together. Social affordances. Social affordances are defined as the characteristics of an online collaborative environment that act as a social contextual facilitators, facilitators relevant for the learner's social interaction. So we learn from your article that you read in how people learn about designing learning environments that one of the main things we want are the abilities to collaborate. That wasn't enough for me. I wanted them to not only be able to collaborate, but to be able to see it online. And I'll show you an example of that. Expert chats, again, bringing in this resource that many times we don't tap. And we wanted that to happen. And then to have not only teacher and student interaction, but teacher, student, and expert interaction. So let me give you some examples of this. You've seen this model before, where students are interacting with students. You have teachers interacting with, with teachers and the experts with experts. 
but more importantly, they can interact with one another, and they can do that all around the adventure learning content. And that is not only in the collaboration zones, but in the expert chats, we have forums, but you have to have people that are bringing people within that um, so that they feel part of this community. So we just came up with this. This is the new collaboration zone, but you'll see right here there are three postings, and then you can click on it, and it's going to open up and what will happen is that this type of posting represents what collaboration zone it is. So before, there was a different zone for each collaboration zone, meaning flora and fauna, um, culture, whatever, the, uh, climate change. Now what we're doing, I said, we need to be able to s show all of them interacting with one another, collaborating. So why don't we put them all on the same map, make different icons for them, and then they need to be able to see each other even when they're put upon each other. So again, it pushes them back within the learning environment. Let's see, yeah, so then it, you see how it, how it pushed it back to their original posting. And then, um, again, we have the sync learning opportunities. This is, you'll see this a little bit later, but this is a posting from one of the schools. And you'll see here, this is the climate, climate zone. Um, but what you see here is that the students can post the videos within it again to showcase and collaborate as much as they possibly can. The polar ice caps are melting, which is causing their breakup, which is also causing the deaths of our many of our furry friends, the polar bear. Collaborate on that, Drew. Then this is the expert chat. And again, this is not a new technology, but we had to rethink the way that we use it. And so this is what the students see. And what's happening, like the question's being sent to the moderator here. The moderator is pushing it to the expert here. And then the expert is choosing what question that was just sent from the moderator that they want to answer. They push it to the environment. And then they answer it right after, creating something that looks like that. Um, again, very simple approach, but it has to be set up correctly. And I'll show you how we do that. Um, this is truly motivating for students because you'll have them, I spent a lot of time in the, in the schools watching them, and they'll uh, put in a, a question. If it's a one computer classroom, they'll come up front or they'll all sit around the computer. They'll put in a question and they'll just wait for the question to arrive to be answered by the expert. In affordance, that works quite well. And this example was, again, going back to the collaboration and creating opportunities for others to showcase their knowledge. Because the experts aren't just the teacher, they can be the students. And this is the perfect example. In 2006, students in Kaktovik, Alaska, uh, created the first blog in the, from the Arctic. And they wanted to talk about what it was like to be students from a whaling community. And the, the very interesting thing about this is that they never talked about um, that they live in the Arctic. You know, that was just not their sense of place. We set up the blog for them, and then um, they just kept on populating it. So it was pretty, pretty fun. Technological affordances. So we have highly usable, structurally sound, and aesthetics. And when you take a look at the online learning environment, what you'll see is that the navigation is such that we want it to be as highly usable as possible. We have one level second level navigation, and then we go to um, A to Z, and the A to Z actually adds a, another level of navigation right down here, which we actually call our fourth level navigation. There's usually one, two, three, and then we start down here and do a vertical navigation. What, what one of the people that we worked with asked us to do is that um, he didn't want them to all load at the same time because it takes more bandwidth. But we wanted him to because we want to give the user the experience to see everything that is available to them in the learning environment at once with under that node. So I don't know if it's right or wrong, but for me, I, wanted to, I think that re is representative of something being highly usable. The other thing that we needed to be able to do is ability to scale up um, based on users. Uh, we take our users in 2004. They uh, increase exponentially, and they have ever since. We're over, um, we reach, I think, 3,200 schools right now. And so we want to be able to design it so that it is um, structurally sound. And that's what I mean by that. 
And then the last thing here is the aesthetics. And I think you are getting an understanding of what aesthetics are all about from not only how we design it with the photos, but the usability of it. And we want it so that when someone comes into the environment, they want to stay there. They want to be part of it. The success of adventure learning is not just a theory. Teachers from around the world use the Go North program to inspire their students to learn. 2007 teacher explorer Jeff Sipper is one of them. So, I mean, the, the, the examples to me are countless because it's like I could run my curriculum by putting all the textbooks on the shelf and running, up, running off Polar Husky for the, the duration of the journey. Um, we would always go down to the computer lab on Monday for the uh, trail update. Uh, the kids would read through that and so as a reading lesson we always would summarize it. We would take a polar husky silhouette and then the, on the legs of the dogs that would be some of the main points that they learned from reading the, the, the trail updates. Um, Since 2004, John Clay, a third grade teacher, has been using Go North to get his students excited about learning and seeing where the adventure takes them next. I am very far from a technology guy. Um, that's the fear factor, you know, oh, I'm not going to be able to find it, I'm not going to be able to uh, do what the kids are doing. And it's, as I said, it's very easy to navigate, it's very easy to find things. The, the big thing is with Go North is that the dogs are the big hook. You get them hooked onto a dog and they will, they'll go, the, the kids will go wherever you want them to go. <laughs> because they go, oh, you know, lightning's going to be the light lead dog, or, you know. Well, lightning is, um, is new to all the commands for being a lead dog. Right, because how old is lightning? Um, and what's nice about uh, the Go North program, it has a bio on each little, you know, each dog, and so uh, that's where you, you hook the kids. Um, very user-friendly. Um, it is as easy for kids to, to navigate and use. For me, um, I don't have to spend hours researching things, um, duplicating things. My lesson plans are already there. It's unreal now where you can go. Um, and all the different things that other teachers have done, and you, you grab those ideas. And so it's not always having to reinvent the wheel. We last year built sleds. Um, it was because a kid went and did some research and said, here's how to build a sled. And so I said, okay. But I think with teachers, sometimes they feel they have to take on the whole piece. And I think if you just start with a little piece first and just say, okay, I'm just gonna learn about the A to Z piece, you know, how to make a, an A to Z book. Parents, uh, the <laughs> it was interesting um, because two years ago I looped. I went from third to fourth, and almost everybody's qu first question they asked, "Are you going to do Go North again?" You know, and it was it was matter of fact, it was just that you know, and the kids, "Are we going to do Go North again?" And it was, you know, oh. Okay, yes, of course, you know. Um, I would have done it anyways, but it was really nice to hear how much that impacted the, their kids' lives. Go North is just the start of large-scale adventure learning programs developed at the University of Minnesota. While adventure learning has already transformed teaching and learning in the classroom, the future of online learning and adventure learning projects is even more exciting. Soon, educators around the world will be able to create their own adventure learning environments in what is being called Adventure Learning 2.0. Educators around the world will use the principles and affordances of adventure learning as they collaborate with others developing and using adventure learning in their classrooms.
Think Forward. Think Research Channel.